Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Thursday night. I'm Joanna Gagas in for Brianna Venosi. Revealing testimony during the January 6th hearing today, focusing on how President Trump put immense pressure on Vice President Mike Pence to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Lawyers and federal judges testified that Pence could not and would not cooperate with Trump because doing so would have created a constitutional crisis. In a conversation between two of Trump's attorneys, Eric Hirschman recalled something he told John Eastman. I said, you're completely crazy. I said, you're going to turn around and tell 78 plus million people in this country that your theory is this is how you're going to invalidate their votes because you think election was stolen. And I said, they're not going to tolerate that. I said, you're going to cause riots in the streets. And he said, worse to the effect of there's been violence in the history of our country, Eric, to protect the democracy or protect the republic. But Pence refused to listen to Trump's demands and instead committed to uphold constitutional law. Trump then turned to the crowd, saying his victory depended solely on Mike Pence. Shortly after, the mob breached the Capitol in search of the vice president, chanting, hang Mike Pence. Hey, Pence narrowly escaped the crowd, some coming within 40 feet of him. Congressman Peter Aguilar presented testimony from a confidential Proud Boys informant saying, The Proud Boys would have killed Mike Pence if given a chance. Pence never left the Capitol and remained in an underground location for more than four hours. He later returned to the House floor to ensure that Congress completed the certification of the 2020 election. The next hearing will be held on Tuesday. In an attempt to rein in spiking inflation, the Federal Reserve yesterday raised interest rates for the third time this year, but yesterday's increase was significant, three quarters of a percentage point. It's an attempt to right-size a growing economy that's become unaffordable for so many. But what does the increased inflation rate mean for you? Rutgers University professor Jim Hughes, Dean Emeritus of the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy, joins me now to explain. Professor Hughes, when we talk about increasing inflation, how will this affect the average American person? Who will really feel this? Well, anybody who has to borrow money uh, uh, is going to be impacted by rising interest rates in order to combat inflation. Everybody is facing higher food costs. Everybody is facing higher gasoline costs when you go to the gas station. Uh, and it's really gasoline and food, which are the really the sticker shock items because uh, you consume those more on a daily basis. Uh, but anybody wanting to get a mortgage to buy a home, uh, it's going to be much, much more expensive uh, than, than it was six months ago. Yeah, explain that. What will this mean for potential home buyers or perhaps for anyone who has um, a variable interest rate that, that is not locked in? Well, most people over the past two or three years have taken fixed rate mortgages because they were at historically low levels. A very few adjustable rate mortgages were out there. Uh, but what this does to the housing market, uh, somebody may take an adjustable rate mortgage today uh, to get a little lower interest rate, uh, but they're gonna, they may be facing more pressures tomorrow. But the key factor is some people are locked in place. They have a very, very low interest rate mortgage. They may have wanted to move uh, and now they're stuck in place, don't want to give up that low interest rate mortgage. Uh, on the other hand, those housing market aspirants, those that want to become homeowners, are already uh, facing difficult situations with really uh, a real shortage of inventory. Uh, and now they face much higher costs with higher mortgages uh, and prices have not adjusted downward uh, despite inflation. 
Right, so the goal of all of this, right, is to drive down the prices that have been skyrocketing, whether it's the price of homes or, like you said, items in the grocery store. Um, but right now, prices are at a peak and we have the increased interest rate. So we haven't yet seen any kind of leveling off there of costs coming down, right? Well, we won't see costs coming down until the economy slows and the objective of raising interest rates uh, is to slow the economy. And when the economy slows, uh, inflation will wane. Uh, the danger is uh, we, we have now uh, resurrected an old term we haven't used for over two decades, an economic soft landing. We want to slow the economy in order to lower uh, the inflation rate, but there's always a danger of it uh, of the economy slipping into a recession and historically when the federal reserve has raised interest rates as fast as they have this time uh, the end result was not a soft landing uh, but a real economic downturn or recession so was this too late and was it too aggressive in terms of how the fed reacted to the inflation that we've been seeing did they go too far with the interest rate increase no they didn't uh, they were late uh, there was a, a failure and again i'm not blaming the fed on this it was a very difficult situation uh, but we did not see the the, sh the differential between a really strong surge in demand for goods and services and all the supply chain disruptions we had and supply shortages so <laughs> they've gotten behind the curve uh, they have to catch up and uh, unrestrained inflation uh, is a far worse problem than a short-term economic downturn. Can you give me a very short answer? Are we staring down a recession right now? Uh, we are in a very, very difficult uh, situation. There are a lot of economic storm clouds out there. Uh, and a recession is a real possibility in 2023. That is a rosy way to end that conversation. Professor Jim yeah. Hughes, thank you so much. Sure. Take care. Low-income renters who faced eviction during the pandemic were protected by an executive order that prevented landlords from ousting them over missed payments between March 2020 and December 2021. Well, that eviction moratorium has now expired, but many of those renters still struggle with the after effects of the pandemic and may still find themselves unable to make rent payments. They're now at risk of losing their housing as more and more landlords are heading to the courts to file eviction cases. In fact, the number of cases has risen from around 53,000 last year to already 59,000 in this year's reporting period. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan spoke with residents and experts in the field about the impact these evictions could have and whether any help is available for those most at risk of losing their homes. That's stressful. Just thinking, you know, I'm going to get evicted with my children. Tamar Boltron owes $9,600 in back rent and faces eviction from her East Orange apartment. Jersey's two-year moratorium on pandemic-related evictions expired at the end of December, and like thousands of other tenants who've since run out of time and money, Boltron's got a hearing in landlord-tenant court. She's told her 14-year-old daughter and 9-year-old son they may have to leave. They don't want to at the school. They're used to being where we at now, the school, their friends and stuff, and just to leave and start over. Low-income tenants in New Jersey still can't be evicted if they missed rent between March 2020 and December 31st, 2021, and certified their status with the state. But there's no similar pandemic eviction protection this year. Boltron just got a job last month as a personal assistant, but says she hasn't paid her $1,600 monthly rent for six months. You know, I try to save up, but with all the bills I have, it's you know, it's adding up and piling up. The pace of evictions is, of course, picked back up because the moratorium has ended. So people are once again losing their homes. Advocate Catherine Wise says that while some smaller New Jersey counties have cleared landlord-tenant case log jams that backed up during the pandemic, others find caseloads increasing, especially densely populated Essex and Hudson. Statewide, the number of newly filed eviction cases has climbed from about 4,430 per month during the moratorium 
to about 5900 a month between July 2021 and this past April, about a 1500 case increase. The rental assistance that the state was so successful at getting into the hands of the people who most needed it has run out. People who cannot pay their rent, whether for COVID-related reasons or otherwise, are not receiving rental assistance and are subject to eviction. It's a mess. It's a mess. And I mean, a lot of this is despite the good intentions of so many. It's a des- desperate situation. And, and I mean, I feel for all players in it. Seton Hall's Kevin Kelly says New Jersey gave desperate tenants three quarters of a billion dollars in pandemic rental aid over the past couple years and promised more. But two major pots of state rental assistance money have run dry, leaving thousands on a waiting list, even as New Jersey anticipates an $11 billion tax revenue surplus. And, uh, you know, and every week we... <laughs> We hear back from the same reports from the state that you know, the money has been requested. Uh, it should come. We don't know when. <laughs> and it's, it's like a limbo, a state of limbo that we're in. Other attorneys report negotiators can sometimes help tenants set up payment schedules based on expected aid. But so we've seen several cases where the parties agree that everything that's owed will be paid by a certain date. And then rental assistance actually comes through a month or two later. Um, But by that time, the landlord claims that the tenant is in breach. She says more tenants now claim landlords aren't properly maintaining apartments, but landlord rep says they're out of time and money too. If a landlord files a case today in Essex County for eviction for non-payment of rent, that case isn't going to be heard until 2023. And so, you know, you're talking about housing providers, landlords that have been struggling through the pandemic. Now things have started to get back to normal, but they still can't get a court date for someone who's not paying the rent in a timely manner. Boltrons applied for aid through Essex County. She's been waiting three months. Hopefully, you know, the the assistance will go through and I'll be able to get help with that so I can catch up. Her court date's July 26th. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. A bill getting fast-tracked through the legislature to pump a quarter of a billion dollars of investment into a popular state park seems like a plan everyone can get behind. But in the case of Liberty State Park, it's never that simple. Today, that bill got a hearing in the Senate Environment and Energy Committee, where opponents say the plan leaves the park vulnerable to commercialization, while supporters argue the park is in desperate need of upgrades. So can they find common ground? Ted Goldberg reports from the State House. New Jerseyans are passionate about the future of Liberty State Park, and there was plenty of passion in a packed committee hearing in Trenton bringing supporters and opponents to debate the Liberty State Park Conservation, Recreation, and Community Inclusion Act. It's a bill that would allocate $250 million to a task force to fix up New Jersey's most popular state park. State Senator Brian Stack is a co-sponsor. The reality today is that Liberty State Park does not serve as many people as possible. It does not have facilities that reflect a great park. It does not have transportation options for people who come or move around the park. It does not have many ball fields or athletic facilities. It does not have community center and cultural and art facilities. Lawmakers heard concern from advocates. While some supporters say potential new athletic facilities are a win for the park and students. I see the lack of facilities that that these uh, student athletes are participating in. This resolves that issue. There's another stadium that's right next to, uh, across the pond, Randall's Island, same concept, track and field facilities, state of the art, and they held national and international meets. Liberty Park is a safe haven. They will be safe there. It's beautiful. They could think higher than public housing buildings. They could see New York. They could see the water. It's needed, please. In Trenton, it revitalized the city and brought them from what was going to be a bankruptcy into prosperity. In Patterson, it revitalized that area so that now the community is involved, engaged, and making it a better quality of life experience. Others are worried that the bill doesn't ban privatization, possibly leading to commercial development in places like Caven Point, a haven for migratory birds. 
Committee Chair Bob Smith said today he will not amend the bill to protect Caven Point, a potential target for golf course expansion. You need to take a time out and to make sure that this bill gets rid of um, the potential for abuse. Right now in that bill, there's more holes in it than in a golf course. And so it's really up to you to tighten this bill up so that we protect the uses of the park for all people. A golf course could be something you see in the park if this bill passes. Other people are worried that massive arenas could choke off access to a public area. Commercial concert venues and stadiums will cause unpreventable, inevitable traffic jams on all nice weekends, which will block public access. We all want public access. That's why the friends and our great allies, many in the room today, have fought commercialization, privatization plans for decades to, to ensure public access to the park. One part of the bill that has picked up attention is that the task force should come up with ways to generate revenue. Supporters of the bill say it wouldn't fundamentally change the character of Liberty State Park, while others disagree. Many of those areas will remain as is, the cherished picnic areas, the children's playgrounds, the interpretive center, all of those will remain in place, but be improved through the park plan with improved access. We are in favor of developing the park in a responsible way that the focus is to provide activities and recreation for all communities, not a revenue making. No free pools, no free anything as far as I could see it. High priced ticket venues for today's cost and into the future. And that's not our parks. We're not gonna turn our parks into turnstiles for revenue generation. They're parks for the public. They're not theme parks like Great Adventure that generate revenue. And that language just needs to be struck. And part of it was. The bill moved forward with five amendments today, including removal of that language, saying the task force could think up plans for the park to generate revenue. In Trenton, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. New Jersey's filing a lawsuit against Ford Motor Company saying they knowingly polluted and contaminated a site known as Ringwood Mines in Passaic County. Ringwood Mines sits in a neighborhood that's home to members of the Ramapo Lenape Nation's Turtle Clan. The acting attorney general and the commissioner of New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection are seeking money to restore the natural resources that were damaged by the dumping of the hazardous waste in the 60s and 70s, including car parts and toxic paint sludge on the ground and in a abandoned mine pits. That toxicity led Ringwood Mines to be labeled as a federal Superfund site, one of 114 in New Jersey. It's the only site in the country actually to be put on the Superfund list twice. Cleanup efforts at the site have sputtered in the past but are now ongoing. The actions against Ford today are probably only one of many actions that will take place. To hold people accountable not just here in the state of New Jersey but across this country where indigenous people begin to have more of a voice to understand that the harm that is caused to these lands are not just harms to the indigenous people or the poor people or the people who don't have, but it in fact will poison even their own children. In a statement, Ford says it takes its environmental responsibility seriously and has shown that through its actions to address issues in Upper Ringwood and that they're working with the state and federal authorities to implement the remediation plan. Atlantic City Casino workers are ready to walk off the job if they don't get a new contract. Unite Here Local 54 voted almost unanimously last night to authorize a strike if no deals reached by the beginning of July. Contracts with the Borgata and the three casinos owned by Caesars Entertainment, Caesars, Harrah's and Tropicana, expired more than two weeks ago. Workers have been picketing since then, but have now given their negotiating committee the power to call a strike if they don't get what they want. They're asking for higher wages amid growing inflation and for casinos to stop subcontracting workers to fill positions for less money. We reached out to the Borgata and Caesars Entertainment, but have not yet heard back. Jeff Payne is a server at Caesars, and he's on the negotiation committee for this contract. He says they're trying everything to avoid a strike. So this just gives us um, that upper hand, knowing that the membership is behind us. Um, we had over 96% people vote for the vote for a strike. So if that's what we have to do, we're going to, to do that. On that last day, if that means we're there till four or five o'clock in the morning, going back and forth to hammer this out so we don't have to walk out, absolutely, that's what we're gonna do. But again, the ball is in our operator's court. 
So far, signs of a recession are not showing up in the job market. Rhonda Schaffler has those details, plus all tonight's business headlines. Rhonda, what are you seeing? Joanna, while there are worries about inflation, higher interest rates, and what's next for the U.S. economy, New Jersey's economy is still churning out jobs. New federal estimates released by the State Labor Department show New Jersey's unemployment rate fell to 3.9 percent in May. May also marked the 18th straight month of job creation in the state. New Jersey's labor market has nearly been made whole since the terrible job losses during the height of the pandemic in 2020. The state has recovered 96 percent of all the jobs lost due to COVID-19. Business groups are reacting to yesterday's property tax relief announcement made by Governor Phil Murphy and top legislative leaders. Both the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and the State Chamber of Commerce saying this will improve affordability for residents, but that the state should now direct some of its extra revenue to businesses. Chamber of Commerce President Tom Bracken, a member of the NJPBS Board of Trustees, says businesses pay almost half of the overall property taxes in New Jersey and they're not getting any relief. On top of that, he says they're still dealing with labor shortages, supply chain problems, and now they have to contend with higher interest rates after the Federal Reserve's move this week. What that does for uh, the business community uh, who is suffering from many things, if they are borrowing money to keep their business afloat, their costs just went up dramatically. So there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty out there, a lot of hurdles for businesses to overcome. They're getting worse by the day. That's why the state needs to focus on that. Meantime, a coalition of unions and pro-worker groups is asking state leaders to consider allocating funds to provide hazard pay for essential workers. They want payments to go to workers who were on the job during the worst of the pandemic before vaccines became widely available. Another day of brutal selling on Wall Street, where the Dow Industrials dropped below 30,000, hitting its lowest level since early 2021. Several market indexes have fallen into bear market territory, a drop of more than 20 percent from their highs. Wall Street is worried that by trying to control inflation with aggressive interest rate moves, the Fed may tip the economy into a recession. Here's a look at today's closing numbers. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. Join Rhonda Schaffler for NJ Business Beat this weekend. She's focusing on something we all deal with, debt. Rhonda highlights steps you can take to cut into your personal debt, whether it's credit cards, medical bills, student loans, or your mortgage. Watch it Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. New Jersey residents in a mental health crisis will soon have a new number to call for help, 988. The crisis hotline is expected to roll out one month from today nationwide and will connect people experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis with a trained health professional 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's meant to be an easier number to remember than the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, but it won't replace it. The timing of this 988 hotline is critical as residents continue to feel the strain of the ongoing pandemic, gun violence, and economic concerns.
concerns. And the resource could be especially critical for rural communities and people of color who often don't have adequate access to mental health resources. Once 988 callers are connected with help, professionals will determine whether additional care is needed and they could send out a local mobile response team if it is, although they expect most cases will be resolved over the phone. The program is being funded in part by the American Rescue Plan money and another $13 million has been set aside in the New Jersey budget this year for suicide prevention. For more on the new 988 Crisis Intervention Hotline, check out the full article at njspotlightnews.org. This is the first article of its kind from our new reporter, Bobby Breyer, who will be covering mental health issues affecting rural New Jerseyans in partnership with Report for America. And that does it for us this evening, but tune in tomorrow morning for Reporters Roundtable with senior political correspondent David Cruz. This week, I'm in for David, and I'll talk with Senate Minority Leader Steve Oraho about plans for relief for New Jersey residents during this difficult economic time. Plus, we analyze all the week's political headlines with a panel of local reporters. That's Friday at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel or wherever you stream. I'm Joanna Gagas for the entire team. Thanks for being with us tonight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.